So that's you on the ground at point A, and the drawing was drawn by your TA Serenity, who is off camera, and she ran away in shame, so if you don't like the drawing, you can blame her. And if you are happy with the stick figure drawing, she is a cat, so that's maybe pretty good drawing for a cat. And the key to solving mock cone problems is, well, it's the key to most engineering problems, is making a good drawing. So in reading through the problem statement, I'm given information that the plane flies 200 meters over a ground observer at point A. All right, reading ahead, we see that we're interested in what's happening when the mock cone reaches point A. So I'm drawing the plane in a new position further ahead, and I draw a triangle, and this triangle represents the mock cone. And the last triangle that I'm gonna draw is going back to point D. Where was the plane when it emitted the sound that was actually first heard by you down at point A? And this is generally what most mock cone drawings are gonna look like. You're gonna be interested in the point straight overhead, some point in the future, which represents, helps you define the shape of the mock cone, and then a point back in the past, which represents where the plane was when it emitted the sound that you actually hear. Now it'll make more sense once I draw a couple of circles, but first let me add a couple of angles. So this angle alpha is the half angle of the mock cone. Because think the cone is not actually just this triangle that's coming towards the ground. The mock cone actually goes in every direction. So it, it's also going upwards as well, right? It's a full up, down, left, right, three-dimensional cone. So the angle alpha is this half angle that represents from the, the line, the direction of the plane itself, to the shape of the cone. And from C to A to D, that is a 90 degree angle. So the angle alpha that's over by point C, by the red sort of at the front, is also the same angle alpha down at point A, headed back upwards towards D. So imagine as a plane is flying, it's emitting noise, and over time, right, that noise travels outwards, right, in a circle, or technically a sphere in 3D. So if we consider point C, the red plane here, as the present, then the further back to the right on my drawing we go, the further back in time we go. And that means the plane at position D, that purple one, has a larger amount of time since it's further back in the past, its sound has been spreading for a longer time, so the sound waves have traveled a larger distance. And then the closer you get to the present, you get a smaller circle because the sound is closer to the present. It's not as far back in the past, which means the sound has not been able to travel as far yet. Now, both of these circles are tangent to the Mach cone. The Mach cone is that diagonal line from A to C, and that's what the Mach cone is. The Mach cone represents that line that is the boundary of sound. In order to hear the plane, you need to be inside the Mach cone. That is, everything outside the Mach cone has not heard the plane yet, and everything inside the Mach cone has heard the plane. So let's keep setting up this problem then. We're given temperature 35 degrees Celsius, so this air show must be on a hot summer day. Mach number 1.4, right? So we're going faster than the speed of sound, so this is something like 900 miles an hour. And a height of only 200 meters, this is something like six or 700 feet. So this makes sense for something like an air show. Because when planes are just traveling from one place to another, they're gonna be way higher than this, like 10,000 meters, around 30,000 feet. So we're trying to find three things. First, how fast is the plane traveling? Second, if you're looking upwards and you see the plane pass overhead, right, the blue color, how long will you have to wait until you can actually hear the sound, right? And the sound you hear will actually be when the plane reaches the red position, but the sound you're hearing was emitted back in the purple position, right, when it was behind you. And then the third thing is that position X, that is how far back was it when it actually first emitted that sound that you're later are the first one that you're actually hearing. Almost every compressible flow problem, and compressible flow is anything dealing with Mach number or supersonic speeds, it's gonna basically always start with solving for the speed of sound. And the speed of sound through air is not actually constant. It changes a little bit at different temperatures, different altitudes, and you get the speed of sound using the square root of KRT. So K is a ratio between specific heat, CP, and CV, that is specific heat holding pressure the same and specific heat holding volume the same. And this is just something you just look up in a table. So for air, we use a value of 1.4. 
temperature has to be in Kelvin. Remember, anytime you're multiplying or dividing by temperature, you need to be using an absolute scale. That's Kelvin for SI units and Rankin for English units. And then R, this is the ideal gas constant. You can probably just look up the value for R for air and get 287 joules per kilogram Kelvin. But if you find the generic ideal gas law constant, 8314 joules per mole Kelvin, you can get the value we need by dividing by the molar mass of air. The molar mass of air, 28.97 kilograms per mole. So when you divide this through, you get the 287 value that you need. So multiply this through, we get about 352 meters per second as the speed of sound. So to find the velocity of the aircraft, since we were given Mach number, the Mach number is just a ratio, the velocity of the aircraft divided by the speed of sound. So I multiply the speed of sound by 1.4, and we get 492.5 meters per second as the velocity of the aircraft. We're a third of the way done, but your TA Indy has been super patient, so quick little break to let him run on his hamster wheel, and then we'll get back and solve the next two parts of the problem. It's gonna be super quick, take no time at all. Let's see if your TA Indy is willing to help out with the second part of this problem where we're solving for time. But first, when I set up this problem, I wrote down the word assumptions as part of my formulation, figuring that each time I make an assumption to simplify the problem as I go through the solution, I'm gonna write down there what I assumed. And so one assumption that I've made here is that the temperature is constant. This is probably a fair assumption from the ground to a height of 200 meters. We probably expect that the same 35 degree Fahrenheit on the ground would be the same at 200 meters. But if this plane were flying at 10,000 meters, right, 30,000 feet, this assumption would not be valid. You would definitely expect it to be colder up at a higher altitude. And so if the temperature in your problem is different at the altitude where the plane emits the sound and at the ground when you hear it, then the time it takes for that sound to travel is going to be a little bit different to solve. That is, it's going to be traveling at different speeds. It'll be slower and then get faster. And so in that case, usually the way that you would solve the problem would be assume your slowest speed of sound, which would usually be at your higher altitude at the colder temperature, and solve for the problem and find time, and then solve again using your faster speed of sound and solve for time in that case, and then maybe take an average in between them or just present a range of variables. You expect the time to be somewhere in between these two extremes. Because by using the minimum and maximum speeds, you've essentially solved for a minimum and maximum amount of time with the real answer will be somewhere in the middle and you'll never be able to figure out exactly where in the middle it will be because you don't know the actual temperature gradient the entire way for the full altitude. You probably are only gonna have two temperatures at altitude and at the ground. But since we're assuming constant temperature for this problem, we can just start using the triangles. So sine of alpha is equal to one divided by the Mach number. This is just something you can look up in your textbook as just one of those equations to write down on your cheat sheet or just look up as you need it. So we get an angle for this Mach cone of 45 degrees. And as a way to sort of intuitively understand this Mach angle, a Mach value of exactly one would have an angle here of 90 degrees. That is immediately upon breaking the sound barrier, the Mach cone is essentially like a vertical wall. It's not really a triangle at all. It's just like vertical. And then the faster the plane goes, the more that wall will sort of shrink down into a triangle and the smaller and skinnier the triangle will get. So a very fast plane going Mach 2 or Mach 3 is gonna have a really narrow Mach cone because it's traveling so much faster that it's gonna make so much more distance horizontally before the sound is able to move slower vertically. Because that's essentially what this is a ratio of. It's comparing the horizontal speed of the aircraft versus the vertical speed of the sound. To find time, I first need to find distance. So I can find the distance between B and C, that is between the straight overhead position and the forward current red position, just using tangent in the triangle. So tangent of alpha will equal opposite over adjacent, that's H, over x bc. And I get a value for that x of about 195 meters, which makes sense since the angle is so close to 45 degrees, you expect this distance to be very close to the 200 meter height. And since distance is velocity times time, we can use the velocity number that we just solved for in the previous part, 
plug in the values and get almost 0.4 seconds. Right, this is pretty quick, but remember the plane's only flying at a height of 200 meters, so the sound doesn't have to travel very far. So this is all gonna happen pretty quickly. So if you think your TAND helped out a little bit with this problem, go ahead and hit the thumbs up and I'll, I'll let them know that you said thanks. And last part of this problem is then to solve for the distance X, that is how far back in time, or in this case in distance, was the plane when it emitted the sound that you hear. But the interesting thing is when you hear the plane, you're not hearing it like directly above you. In this problem, essentially what's happening is when the plane was back at point D, it emitted noise. And that noise traveled diagonally from D to A along that purple circle and that is the noise that you are first hearing. The first time you hear the jet, you are hearing the noise that it was emitted from when it was behind you. But when you look up into the sky, you will actually see the plane in its current position, the red position at point C. So if you are facing left on this drawing, if you're facing towards the red plane to look at it, you'll actually hear the sound coming from behind you from where the plane was when it emitted that sound back at point D. And this is what's really bizarre and interesting about supersonic travel and the Mach cone is that since the plane is traveling faster than the speed of sound, you essentially don't even hear the plane until it has already passed you by. That is, when you look up and see the plane in the red position, you actually hear the sound coming from behind you from that purple position. So we've got another triangle and we're still using that same angle alpha, but this time the vertical alpha. So tangent of alpha is equal to X divided by H and we get an X value of 204 meters. If you've never been to an air show before, I strongly recommend it. If you haven't been in my fluid mechanics playlist yet, go ahead and click here on the screen and bookmark that page. So when it comes final exam time, you can go back to it really quick and easy and review anything from the whole course, the whole semester fluid mechanics will all be right there for you.